Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. As earlier in the week, once a week, I will review a journal article, and this should give us a slightly better idea into how research is conducted and a few clinical points which we can derive from it. Now, the paper which I'm presenting was in November 2014 and has some implications regarding how we offer treatment to women. And what were they looking at? The simple question they asked is when is clomiphene or gonadotrophin stimulated IUI futile and should not be done? They included two studies calling one the fast track and a standard trial and 40 and over, thus looking at different ages which would give us an idea of how the system worked. Now, what do we know? What is generally followed? Let's say we, many centers still do not do AMH, but if we decide and go by this study, they did a day three FSH and E2 levels for a baseline screening. Now, two trials have been looked at, and both these trials suggest that if the FSH is more than 16 and the estrogen is more than 80 picomole a liter under the age of 35, pregnancy rates were not seen in that study which was done in the late 90s. A second study which looked at FSH of more than 13, which was done again in the 90s, in women over 38, there were no pregnancy seen. Now, if you look at it, the pregnancy rates do tend to vary. And there seems to be an impact of high FSH on many of these pregnancy rates. So they had two groups. The first group was of 503 women between the age of 21 to 29 with unexplained infertility. The trial had two arms. Trial 1 was 503 women between the age of 21 to 29, unexplained infertility for 12 months, three cycles of clomiphene and intrauterine insemination, three cycles of gonadotrophin and IUI, and if this did not work, six cycles of IVF. In another group were 154 patients between the age of 38 and 42, an older age group, with unexplained infertility for more than six months. They had two cycles of clomiphene, organiotrophin and IUI, or went directly to six cycles of IVF. They were divided into four groups, and this is very important to know. Group 1A was when the FSH was low, which means normal, of less than 10, milli international units per liter and the estrogen was lower, it was less than 40 picomole a liter. If you have a look at the chart which I'll put, it will explain it much clearly. 1b was when the FSH was again normal, but the estrogen on day 3 was higher, it was more than 40 picomole a liter. Number 2a is when the FSH was between 10 and 15. But the E2 was less than 40. And 2B was when the FSH was between 10 and 15 and the E2 2 was high. Now you may ask why is a high E2 important? Sometimes a high E2 starts masking the effect of a high FSH. And that is one of the reasons why it is important to look at E2 also in conjunction with FSH when you start looking at day 3 bloods. When clomid was given, it was given from day th 3 to day 7, 100 mg. LH test was done or an HCG trigger of 10,000 was given. FSH when used was 150 given daily with an HCG trigger. The aim was to have one or two follicles and IUI was done 36 hours later. The IVF protocol was always a long protocol and the FSH was adjusted depending on the circumstances. 
what were the results with IUI, including the clomiphene and the FSH group. And this is quite surprising. It is no there's no doubt that when your FSH is normal and the E2 is low, your success rate should be the best. And the clinical pregnancy rate was 34%. If your FSH was normal but E2 was high, the pregnancy rate was around 25%. But if you had an FSH of between 10 and 15, but if your E2 was on the lower side, your pregnancy rates were again reasonably good at 33.3%. But if you had a high FSH as well as a high E2, which means 10 to 15 and a high E2, then pregnancy rates went down to 5.3%. There were no live births seen if the FSH was between 10 and 15 and E2 was more than 40. Now if you look at the next slide, what happens in IVF when you had a high FSH between 10 and 15 and a high E2? And when you look at the cancellation rate, the cancellation rate rose to 31%. And that's quite a high rate where eggs were not obtained or there was no follicular growth. When you look at when FSH was on the lower side, or when FSH was on the lower side and E2 was high, the, again, when you look at the, the graph, you will see that the FSH was, where the FSH was normal, the cancellation rate was around 13.4%. When the E2 was higher, the FSH was normal, it was 16%. When the FSH was between 10 and 15, and the E2 was less than 40, the cancellation rate was 17.1%. But as soon as the FSH went up to between 10 and 15, and the E2 went beyond 40 picomolar liter, then cancellation rates almost went up to close to 40%. Again, when you look at this next slide, the number of oocytes which were obtained was less when the FSH was on the higher side, and again, when the E2 level was higher. There were less top-grade embryos to put back. And what if you, if you look at the entire talk, what is coming out is that if your E2 is on the higher side, it is something which you need to look at far more closely in your practice. When you look at this next slide, high FSH and high E2 had decreased pregnancy rate in all ages. High FSH and low E2 also had an impact and that impact was more as a woman got older which means if you had a slightly higher FSH and if you had a low E2 if you're younger your chances of pregnancy would be good now if you have a look at this slide again in the group 1a where the FSH was normal over the age of 40 the chances of live birth rate was 9.7 percent in that group again if your FSH was normal but your E2 was high, the live birth rate was 8%. But as soon as your FSH rose, your pregnancy rates started going down. And that is in the IUI cycles. If you start looking at the IVF cycles, even when the FSH was between 10 and 15, over the age of 40, the live birth rate was 18.2%. But if the FSH was normal, the live birth rate was 39%, even at the age of 40. So when you look closely at the slide, at every age, uh, once you start crossing the age of 38, you are looking at pre pregnancy rate, which starts declining with IUI. In this group, it's, the numbers were so small for IUI and IVF in the ages of 38 to 39 that I don't think that makes much significance. Now this study has limitations and it's very evident that there is an intercycle wearability of FSH, which means what happens to FSH if we do it every month. And what happens is that if your FSH is normal, is less than 10, there's a wearability of around 1 to 2, and an average is 1.7, which means if we keep repeating, you'll see a small variation. It is significantly more when you have an FSH more than 10, where the variation is significant. So if you do an FSH, it comes 11.2 or 12.2, it is possible in the next cycle, you may have a variation and that variation is between 4.9 plus or minus 0.5. So that's a significant variation. 
And that is one of the drawbacks of this study. There is a predictive value of AMH and the antral follicle count has not been included. As you know that AMH and antral follicle count now have a far more significant importance when you look at their impact. If you look at a summary of this, that a high FSH will have a negative impact at all ages and it in fact has to be remembered is one of the most significant factors that decreases chances of pregnancy through IUI and through IVF. The more important thing is as you get older or as your FSH starts rising, it is better to go earlier to IVF where success rates are slightly better than persisting with IUI and to have a lower threshold in cases where the FSH crosses between 10 and 15 percent. I hope this was a slightly shorter paper and it forms the series of between one paper or two papers which will be reviewed and we'll be able to have a look at it. And what I would suggest is if you could go on to fertility courses, there is a once a week teaching program that is done and I can see a huge amount of interaction coming up. I'm hoping that this is carried out where we can discuss and cases openly and I will encourage all of you all to do it. Thank you very much.